Good day everybody, this is Dr. Ali Mugabel. The topic for today is going to be uh, geometric representation of signals. Geometric representation of signals. The material for this part can be found in Hekin's book, Communication Systems, or our usual textbook here is uh, Andrea Goldsmith. That's, that corresponds to chapter 5. The outline for the presentation includes signal space representation, geometric representation of signals, and the Euclidean distance. So we have three things to cover in this topic. Now let's consider signal space analysis, and specifically we'll look at we'll start with looking at the digital communication system. The general shape for the digital communication system looks like this: we have a message source, transmitter, channel, and then we have the receiver. We are using color code here so we can trace the equations. We'll start with green, purple, and then red, and then we have the blue at the output. So because it's digital, because we have discrete message sources, the message source emits a symbol from alphabet capital M. So we choose small m out of capital M. So we have M1, M2, up to M capital M. The symbol time duration is T seconds. Those symbols are generated with a priori probabilities of P1, P2, Pm. That's M1 is produced with probability P1, M2 with probability P2, and so on. So this probability, these probabilities specify the message source output. If the emitted symbols are equiprobable, then we can say that the probability of each one of the symbols is going to be P of probability of M, I, which is 1 over M. So we divide 1 by the total possible number of symbols, which is capital M. That's for the case of equally probable scenario. So we just mentioned what the transmitter, what the message source is. Now let's move to the, trans, to the transmitter. The transmitter maps the encoded output symbols, which is MI, into a distinct signal waveforms. The transmitters, the transmitter will put the symbol in the proper format that can be transmitted over the channel. So we choose uh, the proper waveform for transmission over the channel. Those waveforms, we refer to them here as S sub i, are real valued in this signal that occupies t seconds, and they are allocated for the given symbol m i. If you want to find the energy of these symbols, the, as we know for signals from signals, that the energy is the area under the square of the signal. So the energy of every single symbol transmitted waveform will be E sub i. That's the area under the square of the curve. We integrate over the duration of one symbol. Going from the transmitter to the red here, which is the channel, the channel has a characteristics. We will assume the channel to be linear with bandwidth um, wide enough to accommodate the signal with minor or no distortion. So if we know the bandwidth of the signal, this channel should be able to capture the signal with minor or no distinction, distortion. And then we have the channel noise. Okay, the, the noise is usually added at the receiver, but is uh, in our case, is going to be a sample function of a zero mean white Gaussian noise random process. That's AWGN. Additive, it's going to be added here, plus sign. Added additive white. That's this, the Bohr spectral density is white. Cover all, all all frequencies equally. Gaussian. That's the PDF. Noise. AWGN. Additive white Gaussian noise. So this is the assumption for now. We can have colored noise, but for our case, we'll assume white noise. Now, for uh, as we proceed here, the channel. At the received signal at the output, let's, we, re we refer to it here as x, it's going to be the sum of the transmitted signal plus w. That's in this symbol model. And the, the, the received signal will be observed over the time duration. The same is true for different uh, symbols. So i goes from 1 to capital M. So the receiver would observe this signal for t seconds and makes the best estimate. We want from the received signal SI, which is corrupted with noise, we want to find the equivalent symbol MI that was transmitted. 
So because of the presence of noise, the receiver may make errors, may make error, and we have an optimization problem. It's required to design a receiver that minimizes the average probability of symbol error. That's one of the cost functions. That's one of the criteria we can use to design the receiver. Uh, minimize the average probability of symbol error. That's the probability of error. And we have the probability of choosing M hat, which is our estimate at the receiver site here, to be different than what was the symbol selected at the, at the transmitter or, or transmitted, given that MI is transmitted. And we have to scale this by the probability of being I because we average over all possible symbols. So if they are all equal probable, then this would be 1 over M. If not, then we have to find the probability of every symbol. So we, we refer to this probability as this conditional error probability, given that M was sent. And we need to optimize this function. That's, we need to find the minimum possible uh, value for this. Signal space analysis. To continue with signal space analysis, we would like to design a receiver. The resulting receiver must be optimum in the minimum probability of error sense. So the digital communication system will be based on the following model. Uh, this model is based on the input transmitted signal, Additive white Gauss, Gaussian noise will be added to it, and then we'll have the output signal. So to make this receiver optimum, we need the geometric representation. Instead of dealing with waveforms, transmitted signal or received signal, we will be dealing with the geometric uh, representation and we'll base our optimum receiver based on this geometric representation. The geometric representation for any set of M energy signals is a linear combination of N orthogonal bases. So these are one of the signals that we want to represent. We can say that it's going to be represented as sum of orthonormal bases, which are referred to here as phi, and they are going to be weighted. And this is the coefficient, which is as ij. That's the component of signal i on the base j. We are summing over one up to n because we have a total number of n bases remember that capital m of the number of signals and capital n is the number of bases that is to represent this with the waveform within the time duration from zero to capital t and that should be true for all type of signals so this equation represents the waveform in terms of bases if you want to find the projection if you, do, if you want to do the analysis if you want to find the coefficient of the expansion then we have to project our signal on the base and integrate. We need to correlate with the base and integrate, and that will give you the component here, which is Sij. That's true for all i's and all signals and all uh, base functions. Remember that the base functions are real valued, and they are orthonormal set. They form an orthonormal set. This is the basis function as we refer to. Here is the representation of the two previous equations but in, geo, in kind of graphical representation. So if you want to come up with the waveform, it's made of all the bases summed together and they are weighted by the coefficient. Similarly, here is the projection. This is the synthesis part where we synthesize the signal. And we can have analyzer here on the right hand side where we uh, take the signal, we take the signal now, the, the inverse, and then we multiply by the bases and then we uh, integrate to get uh, the coefficient. So here is with, with the synthesis and we, here we have analysis. That's every one of these blocks is, is called a correlator or a product integrator. We, we have a product and we have integration. Altogether we call it a correlator. Now uh, the geometric representation of signals can uh, be written in the following format where we have those spaces are orthonormal which means if you take the product and integrate, you should always get zero because they are orthogonal, except when, of course, when we compare the base with itself, when i equal to j, you should get one. Why one? Because they are orthonormal bases. Instead of writing it this way, I can just write in terms of uh, the Kronecker delta, 
which which is basically equal to one when i equal to j when these equal to each other or it's equal to zero otherwise so we call them orthonormal bases because each of the bases is normalized have an energy one and they are of course orthogonal if you multiply them and integrate you get zero um, now notice that this set of coefficients that we get will form an n-dimensional vector space if we have only two bases we'll get two dimension three bases three dimensional and if we have n we can represent the signal by a vector which we refer as bolt si it's made of uh, n components and it has a one-to-one -one relation with the transmitted signal so every signal will be represented as n dimensional vector where n is the number of bases we can write the vector in uh, as a column vector here so si the bold base vector the signal vector now we're not sending a signal we are not sending the vector but this is the representation of the signal so we can if we have two only bases we have 2d 3 3d as i mentioned euclidean space and if we have capital n we have n dimensional euclidean space okay so every single signal or now signal vector will be represented as a, can be sketched as a vector and and uh, in dimensional euclidean space So if we have m vectors, we get m different points. So remember that we have a column vector, and this is go called now signal vector instead of waveform. We have, of course, the signal space. I'll show an example in the next slide. So before going to the example, I just want to emphasize why are we doing this? Why are we writing the signal in terms of vector rather than just waveform? There is a reason for this, or there are reasons for this. For mathematical tractable analysis, it will make the math easier to tract, and uh, it will provide the basis for noise consideration in digital communication systems. So we will be doing noise analysis performance in wireless communication systems or wired systems, and that will make the analysis much easier. So uh, an example here in the diagram, we have a signal space of, of two bases we have three signals represented by three vectors s1 s2 and s3 so we can ask questions like for example what's the value of capital n what's the value of capital m n here is equal to two because we have two bases and capital m equal to three okay so this signal is represented by three times phi one and one times five two we can find the component of every base um, other things we can do with the geometric representation, we can define the norm which represents the length of the vector. So this has a bigger norm than this one, which means the length of the vector. We, we represent this as two parallel lines to the right and two to the left. If you do the inner product of a vector, that's multiply the transpose of the signal. That transpose means changing the column into rows and rows into columns. So if you multiply SI, transpose by SI, if you multiply the signal vector by itself as a dot product, which means you square and sum all the entries, you will get the square of the length. Okay, we'll get the square of the length. So where J is the, where SIJ is the jth element of, of SI, and, and this notation means the transpose, denote the matrix transportation, transposition. We can show that the importance of this length is that the square of this length will give you an idea about the energy of the signal. So now we're showing how this is true. Why the length of the signal is directly related to, to the energy. Remember, we are working with normalized bases. So uh, the coordinates will have to do with the energy. So let's start from here. This is the definition of the energy in for any waveform so we, we learn in signal systems that the energy of the signal is the integral of the square now uh, we can write this purple funk part as two summation multiplication remember that this waveform is represented as a uh, weighted sum of, of the bases so we're just having two different uh, indices here we have j and k now everything is inside as remains similar because we have a square 
by using some linearity here and assuming that integration and summation are interchangeable I can just rechange the order and I got the following expression that's it took the summation outside assuming we have a linear operation and then we have the zero to t integration inside luckily this integration will only give you value of one or zero otherwise it will give you one if j and k are the same which means that this summation will translate into only one summation you can use j or k and all the remaining ones would be zero remember that this is going to be one so it's not going to show and this if i equal to j of if j equal to k sorry then this becomes a square and that's basically the definition of the norm squared you just square and sum which we started with so that's that's the end of the proof energy signals equal to the squared length energy of a signal equal to the square length of the signal vector so you just find the length of the vector and square it that's that makes things handy because just by looking at the diagram I can tell which one of these has more energy we can use the same the same uh, methodology to prove that if you have two different vectors and you find the dot or the inner product you can also find uh, the, the kind of the correlation between the two so is I uh, with four multiplied by the other and you integrate will give you we can find it from the vectors so just take the transpose of the vector and then uh, multiply by the other you get the projection so this is called the inner product so note that the inner product of two signals does not depend on the choice of the basis function and it only depends on the component of s of k so we, we can find the projection by by taking the end product Uh, let's conclude this part with the following slide the Euclidean distance the Euclidean distance between two points represent represented by a signal vector okay uh, is I okay the, the Euclidean distance the distance between these two vectors I can show them here as a blue curve the square of this distance can be found by first subtracting the two vectors we get this vector and then taking force the second the, the, the square of the norm and that will give you the distance you can do that by subtracting the coordinates or the entries of the vector square and then sum that's equivalent to working with the waveforms that's equivalent to subtracting the waveform and then squaring because that will give you the energy of the resultant that this is called the Euclidean distance you can also find you can also find the, the angle between two vectors by taking the inner product and then divide by uh, the norm of the two vectors so that will give you the angle between the two remember that uh, that will give you the cosine if you want the angle you take the cosine inverse and there you go so now we are not dealing with the waveforms but rather we are dealing with the vector you can subtract the vectors and then find the length squared or you can find uh, the angle between the two vectors by, by using the following identity these are two handy equations you need to recall As a special case of this, we can say that two vectors are orthogonal or perpendicular, of course, if you take the dot product and you get zero, because in that case, cosine inverse, the angle that has a cosine zero, which is, is going to be 90. So we can take the dot product and show that the dot product equal to zero to find or to prove that the two vectors are orthogonal. So uh, as a conclusion to this part, uh, we can have we can conclude with a small example. Here is our practice for the geometric representation shown and assuming orthonormal basis for the diagram shown here. I just added some numbers for you to practice. So please in the comment section write the answer to the following four parts. We have A, B, C, D. Write S1 and S2 in terms of the basis function. Of course use the numbers. Find the norm of S1. Find the energy of S2. You need to know the difference between the two. Uh, find the angle between the two vectors uh, that's s1 and s2 so this is simple ex exercise just to make sure that we are getting things right and we'll continue with uh, with our course in wireless communication thank you we'll see you in coming videos